holding back, self-restraint, living in hiding, concealing whatever part of oneself does not align with the so-called aspiring model to fit in. Sexual orientation, mental illnesses, disabilities, neurodiversity, you name it. It doesn't take a whole lot not to be considered compatible with the overall group, society, as we like to call it. A petri dish of individual pretending to belong in harmony with a randomly elaborated construct. So I do like stories about black sheep as they tend to remind me of my own journey through life as awkward and cringy as it may sound. Sadly, few of those tend to end well. One of the many reminders, marginalized people seem condemned to remain in liminal spaces. But the price of salt did have a happy ending. It wasn't supposed to, initially, and then it did. And I've read that book oh so many times that the bind eventually broke and all of the pages fell down as you can see right there. It's not ideal, but it is what it is. It is a story about unfulfilled desire, about a love which could have and should have been passionate, powerful, debilitating, or the two main characters had been a man and a woman, but they were not. Carol and Therese are both women in the 50s. Their seduction is fumbling, hesitant, clandestine, even. Have you ever heard of that French verse, pour vivre heureux vivons caché? To live happily is to live hidden? Well, I'd like to call bullshit on that one. Living happily is to live as you are. But sadly, it has not always been a possibility. And there I say, even now. In 2016, Todd Haynes made a film adaptation, a beautiful one, based on Phyllis Snaggy's script, a script that, oddly enough, only retained two sentences from the original novel by Patricia Highsmith to let the overall story shine brighter. Flung out of space. While Patricia Highsmith wrote her novel from her own alter ego's point of view, Therese, both Haynes and Nagy chose to follow the perspective of the person who is in the more vulnerable position, who is kind of more liable to be hurt by the other person and trying to decode every gesture. As the movie begins, we are made to follow Therese as she not only becomes wholeheartedly subjugated with Carol, but most importantly, as she falls in love for the very first time in her life. As the story progresses, however, the movie slowly shifts to her elder's viewpoint as she becomes more and more infatuated with the younger woman. So on one hand, Therese is a distant, almost withdrawn young figure, half-heartedly engaged to a perfectly nice yet oh-so-vapid young man, but she's also awfully young. And while the movie never specified Teresa's age, Patricia Highsmith described her as a character in her early 20s. The way she apprehends the world and the way Haynes translates that apprehension happens through an innocent, almost ingenuous prism. The first time she lays eyes on Carol, Kate Blanchett's character represents everything Therese is not. She's older, confident, elegant, she holds herself with charisma and poise. So naturally, Rooney Mira's character feels captivated by her, but also vulnerable in her presence, something the director made a point to convey. Todd Haynes said so himself in an interview for Canal Plus back in 2016. When I read The Price of Salt, the novel that, that Carol's based on by Patricia Highsmith, the intense, almost claustrophobic phobic relationship of that subjectivity being locked inside Therese's festering mind to me spoke volumes about the experience of falling in love, the distortions of falling in love and the isolation that we often feel at the very beginnings of love, you know, and the way we fabricate and construct everything, you know, all kinds of scenarios and fantasies and and potential run-ins with our object of desire. While Therese might have been unsure of her own identity and desires before, the fascination she suddenly feels for Carol overtook 
any sense of uncertainty. Carol thus became omnipresent to the character, as if the woman had become a sun Therese felt pulled to gravitate and orbit around, which is definitely something Highsmith played heavily with in her novel. Her goal as a writer trying to exercise her own past experiences was to depict how absolute and delirious a love her character dedicated to Carol. As a director, Haynes portrayed that admiration through a series of multiple close-ups on Kate Blanchett's character, all of which conveyed to the audience how magnetic her character is to Therese. In this regard, Carol first appeared as an object of fascination rather than a full-fledged character. In the first half of the movie, she's nothing but a fantasy Therese lets herself be consumed by. While Therese is perpetually filmed barely out of frame, blurred out, outside any line of composition which translates how she tends to evolve on the margin of society, Carol, on the other hand, seems, at first at least, to be the embodiment of said society, or rather, its elite. However, as the story goes, the movie shifts perspective, effectively breaking whatever rose-tinted portrayal of Carol the audience had been presented with so far. And just a scratch beneath Carol's well-maintained polish actually stands a nervous, fragile and anguished woman. To me, the best love stories are those described through the weakest partner's point of view, the more disarmed, the most in love. Carol has all the power and Therese is completely at her mercy. But what is so interesting in this story is that that state of being is being passed from one of those characters to the other, has confided Ains to Roger Ebert back in 2016, I believe. And therein lies the beauty of Haynes' movie. As Therese becomes more and more self-assured as Carol and herself drive west during their road trip, the latter becomes more and more aware her actions will have consequences. Therese's youth happens to be her saving grace within the frame of that romance, but when it comes to Carol, who's older and has a lot more to lose, her budding relationship with her younger counterpart steadily turns into a threat, and she starts to reevaluate her feelings for Rini Mera's character. All of a sudden, Carol turns into a victim of sorts, hostage to her own social class and any convention attached to it, torn between her womanly desires and her own motherly duties. In reality, Carol is nothing like the illusion Therese has built for herself. On the contrary, while she desperately longs for freedom and emancipation, she's also deeply frightened by the price such things might cost her. To be a lover or to be a mother, those are impossible choices to make, and yet one has to be made. Carol and Therese does evolve to mirror one another, not in the sense they become one and the same, on the contrary, both women turn into the exact opposite of the character they appear to be at the beginning of the movie. As Therese spends more and more time with Carol, for instance, she becomes more assertive, bold and headstrong. Whereas Carol, on the other side, lets herself be consumed by her own doubts and sensitivity in a way she's never experienced before, all the while being caught up and trapped by her awful ex-husband and any Puritan conventions attached to him. It is no accident Todd Haynes chose to follow the viewpoint of the character who turned out to be the more in love with the other. His whole movie revolves around both characters' alternating uncertainties. Carol and Therese are just as anxious to take the first step towards one another, pending whether their feelings are being reciprocated by the other or not. While way too many people tend to romanticize the 50s, one should most definitely take a minute or two to ponder what a horrible time period it might have been for entire groups of people. Women, people of color, the LGBTQ plus community, all of them suffered throughout the years, having their all existences dictated by straight white dudes and their petty superiority complex. How delightful, right? I mean, 
The very term homosexuality, or any derivative for that matter, is not uttered even once in any of the 180 minutes of the movie. While the modern audience might have a more open-minded grasp of Carol and Teresa's romantic entanglement, to the point it might even be considered secondary to the story, one ought to remember, when The Price of Salt was first published back in 1952, the contemporary public was not so free of prejudice yet, if we can call a present society open-minded, but that's a whole other debate. And homosexuality, even more so between men, was considered a mental illness, a crime even, so much so that Highsmith was forced by her publisher to sell her story under a pseudonym. Of course, the women's gender, the fact that they the two women falling in love and in the 1950s when such love was, well, if it was men, it would be considered criminal, but it wasn't even worthy enough of calling criminal. It was just a kind of a, uh, an, an extension of female hysteria. You know, that's really important. But I think the film is more than that. You witness people falling in love for, for the first time and all of the dangers, the human aspect of that, which I think is really um, powerful. The notion of clandestinity was not only a narrative frame for the story, it was a reality rooted within its very genesis. Similarly to the author who had to conceal her identity in order to preserve her writing career, Carol and Therese found themselves obligated to hide their relationship from the world around them. In such regards, Carol, the movie, is marked by a double sense of anonymity, that of the original author and that of her characters, something Haynes tried to visually translate not only through a portrayal of constant self-restraint from all parties involved, but also through a thorough reconstitution of the New York of that particular time period. This notion of camouflage can also be perceived through Carol's costumes, the distinguished fur coat Therese first notices about Carol speaks volumes about who Kate Blanchett's character is, or rather, who she pretends to be. In an interview with Vanity Fair, three times Oscar winner costume designer Sandy Bowell explained, The book originally had Carol wearing a fur coat in the meet-cute scene, which obviously denotes luxury and wealth. I needed her to be spotted across a crowded department store and stand out from everybody else, but not in a way that looked out of place. So I chose a fur coat made from vintage blonde mink fur that worked with Blanchett's coloring, while the coral color of the scarf and the hat worked as highlights. With its hem falling right above the knees, because that's just scandalous, right? and the shorter sleeves letting Carol's wrists pick, the garment translates the character's social status and, by extension, the feelings of repression such status entails. But beyond constriction, Carol's style also shows off her own physicality. Since Carol carries herself with a certain caution, all sense of sensuality has to be conveyed through other means than revealing clothes, such as revealing a neck or a wrist, which are more discreet yet just as erogenous zones. When she finds herself alone with Teres, however, Carol feels herself liberated from her social settings and her clothing becomes florier, looser. In this regard, one of the numerous car scenes is particularly telling, as Carol drives and cannot physically remove her own coat, otherwise they would probably crash and that would be an all other story. Therese helps her do so, metaphorically freeing her yet-to-be lover from the binding of her social class, I mean, temporarily. All in all, Carol, and even more so the flashbacks filmed through the perspective of Therese, feel like a dream of sorts. The movie oozes with blurry shots, soft muted colors, slow travelings, while both characters desperately pine for each other. Anyone who's ever been in love knows this much. Memories often look more beautiful than what really happened. Which is why the gentle, romantic haze disappears as soon as Carol abandons her lover in the motel. The bliss of the honeymoon phase thus 
fades into despair and the color palette turns into dirty pinks and yellows, acidic greens to convey the turmoils of heartbreak. In the original novel, Therese aspires to become a set designer for the theater. In the movie, though, Nagy made the conscious choice to change that ambition to make her into a would-be photographer. While this could be seen as a minor swap, has an actual deeper impact on the overall visual story. The character's photographs translate the way she perceives the world around her to an overall clueless audience. Not because said audience hasn't been paying attention to Therese, but because she just doesn't express anything verbally or even physically for that matter, and doesn't even understand her own desires. Rooney Mera's character is a bit of an outsider, or even more so, a spectator. She doesn't understand the world around her and tries to get a grasp on society through the camera and the mundane details she likes to take pictures of instead. What are your pictures like? Oh, I don't know. Not very good, probably. <laughs> no, I mean, what are they? What do you take pictures of? Birds, trees, windows, anything really. The only subject Therese forbids herself to immortalize happens to be what she feels most frightened of. People. I always feel funny taking pictures of people like it's some sort of... In invasion of privacy. Yeah. That's not relatable at all, by the way. Haynes DOP Edward Lackman went on to say through an interview with the French Society of Cinematographers, her photos are fairly abstract city shots which capture the city's shadows, its landscapes, its parks rather than its residents. And as the plot develops and she gets involved in these relationships, she begins to photograph its people. It's almost the same path than Vivian Mayer took with all of the self-portrait and the way she had of seeing herself and projecting that self onto the world that surrounded her. The cold and mechanical device of the camera acts as a barrier between Therese and her new human subjects, but such fantasy of distance is doomed to fail. The way she sees taking pictures of people betrays the way she perceives them. When Carol visits Therese's apartment for the first time, for instance, the audience gets to see a few of those new pictures involving human beings, black and white pictures of anonymous, faceless men taken from behind, never to be the actual focal point. And then we get to discover a beautiful photograph of Carol. Here she stands, right at the center of the frame, looking right through the lens. And this is not about capturing a situation, this is about capturing a person. Her person. And I personally find this scene fascinating in quite a lot of ways. I think my being an introverted queer woman who's fallen in love with oh so many older women before, I for one can relate to that scene in itself, but the way the scene has been directed and acted had such a depth to the underlying intention and implications of what's happening at this very precise moment. As Carol discovers the pictures, Therese stands at the back of the frame, slightly out of focus. Right behind Kate Blanchett, Rooney Mera barely takes the smallest amount of space, almost trying to merge herself with her elder. But Therese refuses to see her reaction to the picture. She hugs herself, she twists her fingers, she balances herself from one foot to another. She's Oh, so nervous, but so eager to please at the same time. It's not only endearing, it's painfully relatable. It's not very good, I was rushed. And on the other hand, Carol discovers for the very first time how Therese perceives her without artifice for the first time in her life, wrapped up in her coat, her hair slightly ruffled by the wind, a calm, serene smile on her lips. Compared to the other pictures, this one clearly shows how Therese cared about her subject, and for the first time, Carol lets herself consider that maybe, just maybe, her feelings towards the other woman are not one-sided. I mean, I can do better. It's perfect.
It is no secret Todd Haynes has taken a lot of inspiration from Saul Later's work, especially when it comes to the photographer's famous experimentations with frames, colors and textures. Thus, both the director and his DOP tried and recreated Leto's way of playing with scales, dimensions, perspectives and field depth through transparency effect, reflections, even visual pollution in a way. And in doing so, Haynes and Lachman remodeled the very idea of perceived reality to adopt the main character's perception of the world. Visual abstractions are meant to echo the impossibility of living openly their love for each other, the onus of expressing their affection through subtle, concealed gestures only. So much so that the viewer is bound to be active. Their field of vision is ever so slightly disturbed to the point of tension, whether it is by a sense of blurriness, rainy halos around traffic lights, streaks of water on car windows. Through blurred pictures, Carol and Therese's respective vulnerabilities are made all the more obvious, tangible even. But while their experience as queer women in the 50s may be painful and difficult, beauty and poetry can also be found. But then again, I suppose that's merely what falling in love does to a person, isn't it? Indistinctness isn't the only motif Haynes has taken from Solito's work, as it is made obvious by the sheer number of glass surfaces featured throughout the movie. Myriad of windows and mirrors thus became transparent frames, distorted, soiled, alienated prisms. And yet, Carol is a movie about intimacy, letting go of the countless fears involving not being loved back, loving more than we're being loved. It all takes courage, but even more so it takes space. And it is that very space Haynes felt so adamant on granting both women. All reflections emerging on those various surfaces before fading away, any of the means obstructing any clear view of a given picture, creating new spaces on both sides as if they belonged to completely different realities. The director thus constantly interposed those abstract screens between his subject and the audience. The troubled visibility of those soiled surfaces both reinforced the notion of desire between both women while implying such a perfect picture remains somehow impossible and inaccessible. As he frees himself from any sense of sharpness, Haynes translates how intangible feelings inherently are, but also how necessary Carol and Therese must still do anything in their power to if not resist them, at least conceal them. As he was interviewing Todd Haynes for New City Films, journalist Ray Pride asked, quite adequately might I add, you look at the images later made and the influence is apparent, but windows and mirrors and frames are occluded images and endlessly gorgeous and potentially symbolic moisture and fog, he opens this magic box of expressive possibilities for capturing an urban landscape. And to that, Haynes answered, for us, it became this return to the whole predicament of looking and who's looking at who and what you're looking through and how much you desire getting around those screens and those barriers to the thing that you want to see. While intentionally blurred pictures are a way to effectively preserve any notion of clandestinity between the two women from society, Haynes also generously played with the idea of distance, i.e. the amount of space between two places or things or people. In order to do so, the director often feigned distances within the frame as he played around with lines of composition, frames within a frame, but also with the looks Carol and Therese exchanged changed between one another. Through composition, Haynes translated the need for both women to mask their attraction to one another by staying as far away as possible. But 
In all this restrained tragedy lies an everlasting poetry nonetheless. Those scenes may appear miserable to the viewer. The obvious tension and the desire felt by both women makes those fake distances quite meaningless. We as an audience don't need the characters to jump on each other every five minutes, we don't need them to kiss passionately like horny teenagers. The movie gushes with desire and self-restraint, sensuality and despair. And this is why the story was only partially about forbidden love, but most importantly two characters learning to understand their own wants in spite of the hostile society they relentlessly belonged to. Carol is a movie about love way before it's supposed to be a story about star-crossed lovers. And anyone who has read the book knows that. In a way, although both characters are, respectively, in their early 20s and mid-40s, the movie can be seen as a coming-of-age story of sorts. Love hurts. Whether it happens between two women, interracial couples, or straight white one, now, don't get me wrong, of course, some of these relationships are easier to live than others, especially according to the space-time frame in which that romance unfolds. However, love does hurt for everyone, only differently. There is so much poetry coming from this movie. I would argue in this regard, the scene where Carol invites Therese to her place for the first time plays even more with those aforementioned distances. You have Therese on the left forefront playing the piano while Carol sits at the back right of the frame wrapping up the train set she previously bought following Therese's advice. While there are a lot of vertical and horizontal lines in this shot, we can also find a fair share of different textures, all of which participate to fragment the space even more. However, there almost seems to be something akin to casual domesticity in this scene, as Carol wraps up her daughter's gifts and Therese plays the piano. It is also worth noting both look in the same direction and, according to French poet Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, Love is not just looking at each other, it's looking in the same direction. Although, I suppose there is no need for French poets when Therese is, in fact, playing Billie Holiday's song Easy Leaving. With Carol, Haynes liked to play with longer shots and close-ups, allowing the viewers to focus on both actresses' facial expressions. I believe it was never Haynes' intention to establish an actual physical space, but rather an idea of impediment, something that is fairly tangible with the way Haynes uses Rivers' shots in this film. Let's take the sequence Carol and Therese have lunch together, for instance. Not too long after the first encounter in the toy shop Therese works at, none of those women truly know each other at this point of the story, but there's already a sense of attraction between them. Therese is quite obviously subjugated by her older counterpart, while Carol is positively charmed by Therese's youth and candor. Both characters are facing each other so much so that more than half of the frame is left empty beside them, as if Haynes was not only trying to press both bodies against one another, but also picture how fundamental it is for both of them to create a space of their own in order to exist according to their own desires without taking the risk of being bothered. To live freely, but in secret, or openly and submitting oneself to the inevitable discrimination of society. What a time to be alive, am I right? Nothing like good old bigotry. Another recurring motive that has nothing to do with Saul Later's work is the phone. Now, I might be a little biased, because phones are something I personally often use in my own body of work, but I found the way Haynes used it throughout his whole movie both quite pertinent and symbolic. Obviously, phones are a way of nullifying physical distances, while still emphasizing how apart two individuals are from one another. 
Both Carol and Therese obviously miss each other dearly when they can all be together. However, that very same phone eventually acts as a metaphor to convey incommunicability. The first time both characters phone each other happens right after Carol forgot her gloves at the shop Therese works out. And I will spare you all the whole glove analysis tangent, but just know gloves are a highly erotic symbol and Carol most definitely did not leave them by accident. Anyway, later on, after Carol sends Therese back after the first rendezvous, which unfolded badly, thank you Harge, you're a dickhead Harge, the older woman calls the youngest to apologize. And it's a beautiful, sensible scene, one of the first I think about whenever this movie pops into my mind. Kate Blanchett holds the phone like she's holding Teresa's hand, carefully, fondly, but also fearfully. She smokes, something she only ever does when she feels nervous. And there's a slight tremor in her fingers, and while her hair is impeccable as it usually is, her mascara has been smeared underneath her eyes. And then Therese asks, I wanna know, I think. I mean, I wanna ask you things, but I'm not sure that you want that. Ask me, please. As she practically begs Therese to just ask. Carol wants to finally put words on something basically forbidden at the time. She's just as scared then relieved by whatever Therese might say, whether it happens to be acceptance or rejection. But as the character finally mustered the courage to say the words, a bunch of party people interrupt their conversation and once again, Therese hangs up. Carol follows a circular structure, following a long flashback introduced by reunion sequence. But the thing is, when the viewer first discovers the movie, they don't know about this structure. They are meant to believe the story is done for already, that it begins with a breakup scene and then goes back in time to explore how the characters came to this point. But here's the main catch. Before he was a movie director, Haynes used to be a semiotician, meaning an expert in the study of signs and symbols and their use or interpretation. His years at Brown University provided him with an extensive knowledge of symbols, which can be found in most of his movies, but especially this one. All of those hidden motifs imply Carol and Therese's relationship instead of openly display it. Because once again, the characters could not exactly do that back in the 50s. As he enciphers any signs of the character's love affair, Haynes makes a point to make it invisible to the world but noticeable to those who know where to look. The train motif is also probably one of the most obvious ones. While in the original novel from Patricia Highsmith the train is used as a metaphor for madness, Haynes adds more depth to it and subsequently a whole new array of interpretation. The first thing that is clearly noticed is how recurrent trains are in these movies. And I'm not saying this because I'm neurodivergent and must love trains out of sheer autisticness, but because that is a fact. Whether it is visual or through sound, the train motive spreads itself all throughout the movie. First, as real noise in the first few seconds of the movie and then in the taxi Therese gets herself into as she lets herself be consumed by her memories and then of course as the toy train set to name but a few. However, that latest one has to be the most relevant to the story. The narrowness of the circuit translates a maze on a beam for the two women's destiny condemned to endlessly go around in circles. Something Carol herself seems to grasp she looks almost sadly to the train, as it relentlessly takes the same route again and again and again, as if witnessing the ineluctability of her own life. There are no accidents. Everything comes full circle. 
Building this movie like an infernal loop, Haynes entraps the viewers just as cruelly as he entraps his characters. He makes them believe the ending has been decided already, hell, even played out. Haynes is ruthless. Not because he makes the viewers believe the story could still end well despite showcasing how it ends before it even began, he's ruthless because it makes everyone involved, characters and viewers alike, believe Carol is not as much of a love story than a tragedy, doomed before it even started to unfold. And yet, the first time the sequence is being screened to the viewers happens without any context whatsoever. We get to follow an anonymous man through the New York streets before he enters a hotel and stumbles upon two women seemingly having dinner together. As he recognizes Rini Mera's character, she turns around like a deer caught in headlights, while Kate Blanchett maintains her composure right before gathering her belongings and then starts to leave. At this point in time, it seems Carol has the upper hand against Therese, but as the viewer rediscovers the scene near the end of the movie, they're meant to see it in a new, different light because of everything that has happened beforehand. This time, we get to adopt Carol's point of view, looking at her former lovers sitting there like an Edward Hopper painting. Not for the first time, but perhaps even more so than previous occurrences, Carol appears hesitant, unsure of herself. The calm, self-assured woman she used to be seems long gone now, while Therese can only be described as cold and decidedly silent. The two women look at each other with the intensity characteristic to people who have fallen in love before and then got their hearts broken in the process. The apartment's a nice big one. It's big enough for two. I was hoping you might like to come live with me, but I guess you won't. Would you? Oh, I don't think so. That's that. I love you. God, if I was made of sugar, I would be dissolving in my own tears. All in all, it would seem that train has come back to the same station it departed from in the first place. We, as an audience, have already watched Carol go away. We know both women part ways, but do we? I've watched many, many movies in my life and read twice as many books in poetry, and no quote has ever struck me as hard as this one. The mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. A process that cannot be understood by stopping it. We must move with the flow of the process. We must join it. We try so hard to find purpose in existence, as if life happened only to be granted a secret meaning. But there is no meaning to life. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying life is pointless. But isn't being alive enough? Life isn't a quest, a challenge to succeed. Life is what happens from the moment you were born to the day you will die. And I know we tend to say life is short, but it's also all we have. And all you can do is keep working. Use what feels right. Throw away the rest. Therese wants Carol still, and Carol wants Therese, she hasn't stopped doing so. And it's pretty much as simple as that. The younger woman has grown up, realized who she was. So she goes, she goes to the oak room where Carol is awaiting her, and they just look at each other, and the infernal cycle is broken. So to hell with fate, I suppose. Have you ever tried to be with someone you're actually forbidden to love by law? Me neither, but I've heard it's not a walk in the park. Since humanity tends to have a strong penchant for bigotry and for further reference, you can take a quick look at basically any single point of history. Um, Carol and Therese can't do so much as touch each other without putting themselves at risk, especially Carol, who's 
a mother and could lose any parental rights to her daughter. So much so that both women don't spend that much time together within the time frame of the film. They may be phone calls, they might buy each other's gifts, or they may talk about the other one to their friends, but in the end, Carol and Therese long for actual physical contact and barely have the chance to actually touch one another. Actually, I think they touch each other like five times in the whole movie. Because of how clandestine their love is, the two women won't be able to consummate their love until quite late in the story. And what a scene that is. We have Therese sitting in front of a model mirror and Carol standing right behind her, her hands resting on the younger woman's shoulder like a reenactment of their very first contact. As Carol brushes her fingers through Therese's hair, the latter takes her hand in her own and the two lovers exchange a look through the mirror as they would a prohibited painting, unsure of what to do, what to feel, how to act. So Carol hesitates for a moment and then she starts undressing herself, but her movements are slow, not of seduction, but out of doubt. There is no use of slow motion on Haynes' part in that scene, and yet time seems suspended in a way. But as Therese turns around and kisses Carol, it's like the movie starts breathing again. And speaking of the kiss, the viewer won't be invited to see it, not completely at least. The angle this scene has been shot with feels like a reminder or even more so a mockery of the Hayes Code which used to be in full force <laughs> back in the 50s. While delayed gratification is always a rather effective process to keep the audience's engagement in check, I would argue the lovemaking scene isn't nearly as beautiful as the last time we get to see the characters touch each other. Right after Carol confessed her love to Therese and right after she did not get the chance to hear it back, she leaves. But as she does so, she takes just a few seconds to rest her hand on Therese's shoulder. A gesture so trivial to anyone else and yet so heavy for both women, so heavy in fact, Therese lets herself lean into it and closes her eyes. And as Carol lives for good, Therese keeps looking to the side, looking for a ghost of some sort, trying to turn back time perhaps. And then her friend does the same to her other shoulder and she doesn't care for it, she doesn't even seem to notice. intimacy is only ever worth in the margin of the world. Granted, we don't exactly live in an age in which intimacy feels intimate anymore. Not to sound like a grandma or a clueless politician, but the rise of social media and the ever-growing need for external validation has made masses of people start broadcasting their lives. And yeah, while I'm one to talk as I speak to a camera about movies as if it mattered in the slightest, some people do not hesitate to transform their whole private lives into public shows or even bronze without a care in the world. Children, parents, friends, significant others have now turned into side characters for vlogs and Instagram accounts. But as you might have guessed already, there used to be a time where that game of display wasn't exactly on the table. Not so much because the Wi-Fi hadn't been invented yet, although that did not help, obviously, but because some people's very existences were something of a taboo. Hell, it still is in some parts of the world, including good old Uncle Sam, but I guess that's another conversation once again. As Therese watches Sunset Boulevard, a movie that simultaneously happens to be one of the greatest films ever made and any first-year film student's worst nightmare, her friend Danny explains he's watched the film six times already. Can't relate to that. Right now I'm charting the correlation between what the characters say and how they really feel. That meaningless piece of dialogue actually holds the key to the whole movie. Carol may be a romantic drama film, the heart of the romance has to remain hidden, concealed. Therefore, 
Most of the movie's approach to the relationship happens through subtext and implying what must remain unspoken. Everything the characters might want to express either to themselves or others but ultimately cannot out of shame or fear or potential consequences or even sometimes because they just don't know how, has to be kept silenced. How does one communicate what they cannot even understand, let alone name? How does one grasp a concept so taboo it isn't supposed to exist according to society? How does one identify a desire when it seems they're the first to ever feel it? Carol and Therese's feelings for each other are not conveyed to the viewers through dialogues, although it's my personal opinion, dialogues should never ever matter this much that a situation must be explained to be understood, but visual, frames, editing, acting. Scriptwriter Phyllis Nagy said so herself in an interview for Vanity Fair back in 2016. There is clarity and there is over-explication. Carol is a hugely emotional film but it isn't sentimental. It asks the audience to participate in or feel the strange stirring when you first fall in love. While Carol is older and has definitely fallen in love before. This is Teresa's first proper love story, something that is fairly obvious seeing the way she looks at her elder with absolute wonder and stars in her eyes and pretty much, I mean, who wouldn't look at Kate Blanchett like that, right? So anyway, I have talked in another video about the intensity and turmoil's first love entails, and yes, it's about Twilight, and no, I have no regrets. And sure enough, Therese isn't exactly a teenager anymore, but she's desperately young and inexperienced still. Granted, she has a fiancé she could not care less about, but when it comes to love, actual maddening, obsessive, all-consuming love, she knows nothing. You know nothing. She's awkward, she doesn't know how to speak, how to act. I mean, she doesn't even know what to order at the restaurant when she's with Carol. And Carol, yes, she's fallen in love before, but not like that, has she? Her charisma might remain, but the poise is long gone by the time she realizes she's actually fallen for Therese. There's no point faking it anymore, although she tries to do so anyway. She's so used to control herself, she sometimes feels inauthentic, artificial, like, like, like one of those dolls Therese used to sell at that toy shop, which in a way is the whole point of Blanchett's character. The way she holds herself back at all time to preserve her place in her broken family and society feels so exhausting, it seems to seep right into her very core. But she can't control her eyes, no one can, and not to give into cliché, but aren't eyes supposed to be the windows to the soul? There's tragedy in love without expression, love without touch or soft words. Metaphors and motifs can only last so long, can they? But I guess Sunset Boulevard warned us, in a way. Still wonderful, isn't it? And no dialogue. We didn't need dialogue. We had faces. As I may have said before, Nagi has only retained two sentences from the original novel, and while all dialogues are an original creation from her, it truly is through silences her script shines the brightest. Not only Carol and Therese don't exactly spend much time together, as I've previously mentioned, but they don't talk much to each other either. Their emotionality is bound to muteness, in a way. In fact, Carol is such a quiet film, critics called it cold or even chilly. But just like I previously mentioned, when I was talking about the motives and knowing where to look, journalist Richard Lawson wrote for Vanity Fair that the movie spoke in vernacular that only queer people are fully fluent in. Arguing the movie doesn't foster a certain underlying violence beneath, if not atop, of the love story, Haynes depicts is idiotic, to say the least. 
but it's also a quiet, gentle movie, a poetic movie, a movie that leaves as much room as is humanly possible for these two women to love themselves freely, even after everything has gone sour. And that's how we get such beautiful scenes like the one where Therese is developing her photographs in her own makeshift red room. The desire and longing awakening in her as she discovers these pictures is so strong, she cannot refrain herself from trying to go and phone Carol again, although they've broken up. As the latter answers, she doesn't trust herself to speak and remains silent. And have you ever been in love with someone who loves you back but you cannot be with? I don't know of many sentiments more painful than that. It's like grieving for someone as they live, like mourning what could have been but can never be. So she says her name, softly, like a prayer, a supplication. Carol. And Haynes frames Carol in a close-up so tender yet so excruciating. The viewer can see how agonizing not answering Therese is for her. She's exhausted, beaten, wrecked. And Belwell's music finally quiets down. It's like a reenactment of that first scene when Therese was seconds away from asking her, is there something going on between the two of us? And the intention is the same here, but so much has passed. Do you love me still? I love you, don't go. Carol can't even bring herself to hang up properly, the phone being pressed against her lips like the ghost of her former lover's kiss. She hangs up with the finger instead, prolonging the illusion of communication even though there's only silence and despair on the other side of the line. I have asked that before. Have you ever been in love with someone who loves you back but cannot be with? Well, fuck that. Fuck restraint. Fuck holding back. Fuck it all. Later in the movie, as Therese realizes she never ever should have left Carol leave her at the Ritz, she goes to the Oak Room and the slow motion translates how anxious she is not to find Carol there waiting for her. So she takes a few steps forward, impatient, terrified. Hain's camera shakes just as much as the character feels on the inside. And once again, the music drowns out any foreign noise. And this is Teresa's world now. And Carol must be in it. The original scenario of that scene reads, then, out of the corner of her eye, almost imperceptible at first, at the table towards the rear of the room, she sees a woman's blonde head thrown back in laughter. The woman seems to be encapsulated in or protected by a haze of light and smoke. It's Carol. Carol as Therese has always seen her and as she will always see her evermore like in a dream or a single defining memory, substantial yet elusive. She moves towards her. Carol raises a wine glass to her lips and as she does, she turns slightly and spots Therese. She is not startled. We see her face softening. Therese continues to approach. Carol watches with a smile burning in her eyes. Therese has nearly arrived. Without a single word, both women know there's hope all of a sudden. Some people have talked about an open ending and I disagree wholeheartedly with them. Carol told Therese to come and find her here, were she to change her mind. And here she is. In no way, shape or form is this an open ending. There is just no need to say any more. Love is awful makes you doubt yourself, judge yourself, distance yourself from the other people in your life, makes you selfish, makes you say and do things you never thought you would do. It's all any of us want and it's hell when we get there. So no wonder it's something we don't want to do on our own. If we're born with love, then life is about choosing the right place to put it. People talk about that a lot, it feeling right. When it feels right, it's easy, but I'm not sure that's true. It takes strength to know what's right. And love isn't something that weak people do. With Carol, Haynes doesn't do so much as direct a movie about forbidden love, but more so 
a movie about how necessary it is to live according to one's own true self. And I know times have changed and some, or dare I hope, most people have gotten rid of their prejudices and are now willing to learn and open their minds. But unfortunately, in spite of all of the progress we've made since the 50s, and yes, there are privileged spaces where sexuality, genders, ethnicities don't matter, but those spaces are not infinite. And there are still communities where bigotry and ignorance prevail. Every single day, we encounter stories about marginalized groups being ostracized and suffering. And to these days, there are still at least 64 countries that have laws that criminalize homosexuality. I wish I had something profound to say to conclude this, but I suppose the movie itself is beautiful enough in that regard that I don't necessarily need to say more. So I won't.